You're watching Bloomberg Law. I'm Lee Pacquia. Over the past three years, we have seen a tremendous rise in social activism, with groups like the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street demonstrating that people on both sides of the political spectrum want to get big money out of American politics. But apart from articulating a dissatisfaction with the status quo, there has not been much in terms of palpable change, or even a plan for change at that. My guest today has written a concise and explicit proposal to start such a process. Joining me now is Lawrence Lessig. He's a professor at Harvard Law School. The name of his new ebook is One Way Forward. We're thrilled to have him with us. Professor, thanks so much for your time today. Welcome. Great to, great to be here. Thank you. So before we kick off, I have to ask, why write this book now? It, it comes out shortly after uh, publishing a previous work called Republic Lost, which picks up on similar themes. Why write another book on this subject so soon? What's changed? Well, I think what's changed is an opportunity to actually see real reform uh, b get demanded for uh, in, in a way that we couldn't have, I couldn't have imagined e even uh, six months ago. So the point is that um, we're beginning to see this outsider politics movement take off uh, on both the left and the right. And the thing that struck me as uh, crucial was that both sides begin to recognize the way the other side is a potential ally, not an opponent. Um, so when I see the Occupy movement attack the Tea Party, I think they're making a mistake. I think they need to recognize that while they shouldn't agree with the Tea Party or embrace the values of the Tea Party, and maybe not vice versa, they need to see that how they, they need each other if they're going to do something to bring about the change inside the Beltway that they both want to see. Mm. And we also had something which I thought was interesting. It was almost apolitical in a sense, the SOPA and PIPA debate. Neither Occupy Wall Street nor the Tea Party claimed it. Is that how you see it as well? Yeah, I think that uh, the, the SOPA and PIPA uh, re revolt um, is another example of what I'm describing in this book. I, I say in the book, you know, we have these waves of outsider movements. Um, and, you know, I think MoveOn in 1998 was the first of these in our recent history. Um, and I think the uh, Tea Party was one. I think the Occupy movement was, was one. I think the SOPA and PIPA um, revolt was, a, was another, and they're all distinct, and they have, they have different mixes of people, they have different things motivating them, but what's common is that they become, uh, they rise up not as politician wannabes, but as people just disgusted with what their government is doing, and they bring enormous power uh, to bear on top of our government to force the government to do something, and SOPA and PIPA uh, revolt was actually the most effective in this uh, recent time, and in, in waking Congress up to the potential of these outsiders to do something effective. So I think it's distinct. That's why neither side got to claim it. But it's another example of how these outsider waves um, could begin to create the energy necessary to effect real change. Mm. Uh, one thing that jumped out at me, corruption is a theme that runs uh, through the very heart of this text. Could you explain uh, to me how you see the government and the political system as corrupted? Yeah, I, mean, I don't see this system is corrupted in the old-fashioned Rob Lagojevich, Randy Duke Cunningham sense of corruption. I'm not talking about bribery. I'm not talking about anything that any criminal statute tries to regulate. Instead, I'm talking about a kind of corruption which is legal, not le illegal, which is in plain sight, which is obvious to everybody. It's the kind of corruption that gets produced by a system that funds campaigns where it's not the 1%, it's the fraction of the 1% that funds the campaigns that determine who takes control of Congress um, or who's elected president. And, and that system for funding campaigns can't help but get candidates and elected representatives to, to skew their view in a way that leads most ordinary Americans to believe money is buying results in the political system. Indeed, as I found in my book, Republic Lost, 75% of Americans believe money buys results in this system. Mm. And when that's the view of ordinary Americans, that's why ordinary Americans come to be so cynical about the existing system. So the confidence in Congress um, you know, hovers between the 5 and 11% range, depending on which poll you look at. Because most of us look at this institution and say, we wouldn't trust it with our life, even though we do trust it with our lives, because they make fundamental decisions that will affect the lives of us and of our children. Mm. And we're, we're talking about a system here, talking about American politics in general, that's inordinately complex and becoming more complex seemingly every time there, there's, a, there's an election. What precisely, in your opinion, is the problem? Is it that there's too much money in our political system to begin with? Is it how it's allocated? Where, where do you point your finger at the end of the day? 
Yeah, I think that, you know, so long as money is going to be in the system uh, because campaigns cost money, we should expect that representatives will be responsive to the people who are giving them money. The problem in our system is not the level of money. It's not the fact that money is in the system. It's that money is coming from a tiny, tiny slice of America. So 0.26% of Americans give more than $200 in a congressional campaign. Wow. 0 0.05 give the maximum amount in a, in a congressional campaign. 0 0.01, the 1% of the 1% give more than $10,000 in an election cycle. So this is a system where the tiniest slice of America is funding the elections. And in that system, it can't help but be the case that the elected representatives are more responsive, more concerned, uh, more eager to please the one tiny slice of America than to, than to please the rest of America. And that's the essence of the corruption here. And the response, the, the answer to that corruption is to find a way to fund elections where the people are the funders, not the funders, the tiny slice of 1% funding the elections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you had uh, one proposal uh, in your book that uh, tried to find a way to get every citizen in America uh, participating in the campaign finance system. Could you flesh that out for us a little bit? Yeah, so the idea is uh, we take the first $50 of revenue that everybody contributes to the government, and everybody does contribute in the sense, in quotes, they're taxed, the government at least $50, either through income tax or uh, pay payroll tax or social security tax. So take that first $50 and rebate it back to Americans in the form of a democracy voucher. And that voucher you can give, either all of it or part of it, to any candidate for Congress who commits to taking only vouchers plus contributions of up to $100 to fund his or her campaign. So this would be a system that would fund elections with small dollar contributions only. And if it's $50 a, a voter, that's $7 billion in the election system. That's three times the total amount raised and uh, spent in 2010. So it's real money, but small dollar money that would change the way candidates would be in the business of trying to raise money. They wouldn't be talking to the 1% of the 1%. They'd be talking to the broad range of citizens who would be turning their vouchers into the system in order to fund these campaigns. Mm -hmm. and it's interesting. I mean, essentially, at the end of the day, critics are going to call uh, that particular part of your proposal a, a tax. Is this political environment anywhere near being receptive to putting taxes on American citizens to fund campaign finance? Yeah, but, you know, the point is, it's returning the tax that we're already paying. It's a rebate. I, I don't know many people who think of a rebate as a tax. It's a returning of money that we otherwise were paying, and then that rebate then gets used in a way to fund elections so that the funding of the elections is something citizens are more directly controlling than they control right now. Right now, ordinary citizens don't control the funding of elections because even if most ordinary citizens participated in that way, they would not begin to match the contributions and the influence being uh, exerted by the tiniest fraction of the top 1%. Mm. And you're also calling for an Article 5 convention basically to amend the U.S. Constitution. How did you settle on uh, that direction? And uh, I got to say, that's a huge undertaking. How would that, how would that happen? Yeah, so the basic insight, insight here is, and this is something I talk about in my book, Republic Laws too. if the problem is Congress, if Congress is at its core corrupted by the current structure of influence, we can't depend upon Congress to solve that problem. Um, you know, I hope they do. I'd like to get back to my ordinary life and, and not be worried about these issues anymore. But we can't depend upon it. And the only way the framers of our Constitution gave us to evade a uh, process controlled by Congress is if the states get together and demand a convention for the purpose of proposing amendments that then get, have to be ratified by 38 states. So the convention process was our one escape hatch from a corrupted Congress. And that's what we have, a corrupted Congress. And the only way to solve that corruption is to find a way to change the influence from the outside. Mm. So the convention, it seems to me, is the only way that we have right now, um, short of uh, um, of finding a way to get uh, Congress itself to change itself, and I, I don't actually see that's going to happen anytime soon. Right. It was interesting to me how you almost seem to jump beyond the issue of Citizens United itself and, and go for a more broader overhaul to the entire system. What made you get to that point? 
Well, you know, people talk about Citizens United as if Citizens United broke our democracy, as if on January 20th, 2010, the day before Citizens United was decided, we were just swimming along beautifully and all of a sudden the Supreme Court destroyed everything. But of course, on the day before Citizens United was decided, our democracy was already broken. The influence that I'm talking about was an influence that existed long before Citizens United was ever even conceived of as a Supreme Court case. So it's a dangerous misconception to say that solving the Citizens United problem, reversing Citizens United, in any sense solves the problem of the corruption inside of the system. So I don't focus on Citizens United. Of course, I think it needs to be addressed. I actually think the Supreme Court is going to reverse it itself. Uh, but I don't think we ought to be talking about the problem as if it's Citizens United, because if that's true, if the Supreme Court reverses it, then we're going to be left with no movement arguing for the real change that's necessary to make it so people could have a reason to believe in this system again. Pro Professor, I have to ask, why do you think the Supreme Court is going to overturn Citizens United? Well, you know, court decided that case in a very narrow majority. And, and uh, you know, the majority is made up of very different characters. Um, some of those characters, um, you know, stick regardless of what they think the public's reaction to an issue is, stick to their principles, um, and don't even rethink the principles. But some of them, I actually think, are surprised. I don't have inside information here, but I'm saying they can't help but be surprised, both by the public's reaction and by the extraordinary change that their decision brought about in the way elections are actually funded. You know, we have a system where 196 Americans have contributed 80% of the money that has gone into the super PAC spending so far. Less than 200 Americans constituting 80% of the spending. And I think that as a Supreme Court justice, you look at the system and you begin to hear the words of Justice Stevens in dissent when he said, not many Americans would believe that the problem with American democracy is that corporations don't have enough influence in our system. Right. He would hear those words and begin to think, maybe there was something to this point and I need to rethink exactly what the principles of the First Amendment mean in the context of this kind of corruption. Mm. So, Professor, uh, this book is out there. It's gotten a great reception uh, so far as I can tell. What would you like to see happen next? Well, we, uh, we think that this is a long-term process. And this book has been released, and in six months I promise to revise it and release it freely in a wiki-like form. Um, so that more people can begin to be in the process of describing what the changes have to be, what the steps are to get us to those changes. But the, but the key thing that I think uh, we need to do right now is to build this anti-corruption movement. And we have a site that we'll be launching in the morning, which I talk about in the book, called the Anti-Corruption Pledge org, where people can go and make a pledge to do the work necessary to bring about the change in this corrupt system. And if we can get, you know, 300,000, a million people to join this particular pledge, then we can begin to show the politicians who are keen to ignore this issue that this is not an issue they should ignore. That instead, this is an issue that is as important to Americans as any of the other top 10 issues which are typically talked about inside of these political campaigns. All right, Professor Lessig, I want to thank you very much for your time today, sir. Thank you. That's Professor Larry Lessig from Harvard Law School. If you'd like to learn more about the cases and issues we just discussed, be sure to check out our offerings on BloombergLaw.com and also on the Bloomberg Terminal. I'm Lee Pacquia. Thanks for watching.